sleep is for chumps. Writing, it's a popular new hobby taking the world by storm. I think it might stick around. And lucky for me, cause turns out, I got a lot of stuff to talk about. I've struggled with making writing videos in the past because I assumed my thoughts were all just common knowledge. Like everyone academically studies their own recreation, right? Right? I almost didn't include that Jack Sparrow bit last time because I thought that's what everybody talks about at parties, but turns out I might actually have a useful or at the very least uniquely entertaining perspective. So I got some episodes in the works on world building, musicals, female character representation, Doctor Who showrunners, time travel. I just got to pick one for this week and what's that? Those are all comments from the last video. They're all about Fallout. Like they're all about how I should have watched the show before I spent an entire video criticizing it for lack of payoff. Why are they all printed out? Just for the visual gag? I can respect that. Kind of just look like bills. You sure I didn't just scoop all of those onto a table as a prop and then talk off screen to make it seem like I'm not the only one in the room? No? Okay, good. And done. All right, here's the thing about Fallout. Maybe it was a little bit silly of me to comment on a show I hadn't finished watching. I assumed a foolproof way to keep my criticisms contained within the first two episodes was to only talk about the first two episodes, but it turns out I was accidentally talking about things from later episodes because the writers decided to put things from the beginning of the story somewhere else. Lucy does start asking questions and comparing her experiences to others and acting more as an anchor for the audience. She just waits until over halfway through the season to do that. Her brother Norm does get a lot more screen time. It's just not quite what I had in mind when I was talking about him being the main character. I meant it would be cool if he were the one to go out onto the surface because of his implied cowardice and how that would make for great contrast against the post-apocalyptic wasteland. Instead, he changes personalities and digs up information on the vaults for us so Lucy doesn't have to. It's kind of like exposition outsourcing. The ghoul is pretty fantastic, actually. It's not a terrible show. It's just guilty of some familiar writing pitfalls that I feel like I've seen way too much of in recent high-budget productions made by the richest corporations on the planet, and so I'm judging it pretty harshly and maybe a little unfairly. I thought I might do a whole episode on Fallout just to cover my bases, but I'm not really interested in doing these as individual movie reviews. I'd prefer to talk about some broad writing concepts and storytelling patterns that often catch my attention, and this show actually reminded me of a lot of them, so I think I'll just do those and have it ride shotgun through the next few videos. Today I want to talk about drama versus mystery, or the dangers of never telling your audience anything ever. What is drama? In this context, I'm using it to mean something very specific, a promise and a payoff. Whenever we see a superhero origin story, we expect one thing, that the main character will eventually don a mask, take to the streets, and punch some guy so hard he can never do crime again. In Avatar, every episode begins with the reminder that we are watching a 12-year-old boy master control of four base elements to save the world from fire Nazis, and by the end of the third season, he has done exactly that. And in Romeo and Juliet, a guy comes out on stage and tells you point blank, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, and then you watch that happen. There are twists, there are turns, there's uncertainty and bonus explosions, but in the end, you get what you were promised. It's establishing expectations and then following through. It's physics, and it should be satisfying. That simple feeling can exist in any story. In fact, it's the driving force behind all storytelling. Imagine if your friend started a story with, so this morning I got out of bed, brushed my teeth, made a bagel that was a little stale, which I realized was because I forgot to close the bag. Then I got in my car and went to work. That annoying song was playing on the radio again, you know, the one that's just like, I can't quite remember how it goes. But anyway, I was driving. Did you stop listening to me yet? I did. But if your friend goes, dude, the craziest thing just happened. I got rear-ended on the highway by Nicolas Cage. You would want to know more details right away. That may feel pretty obvious, but then why do so many TV shows treat us like we will immediately stop paying attention if they just tell us what's going on? Lost is obviously famous for this, and so many other shows followed his example, holding their payoff hostage to ensure that you continue to tune in each week. J.J. Abrams, the guy who directed the first episode, bailed and then kept taking all the credit. Man, that happens a lot. Nerds who didn't do the thing they say they did. Anyway, Abrams coined the term mystery box, which is a writing technique in which you show a box, but not what's inside, and the desire to know what's in the box keeps people coming back again and again. The trade-off is that you eventually have to open that box, and if it's not as good as you said it was going to be, 
It's gonna make people real mad. Regardless, producers thought this was a brilliant idea and decided to do it forever. But it's a garbage technique and turned a lot of people off to mystery in general. But mystery is the opposite side of the storytelling coin. That must be the bad side. It's not. Mystery is as essential to storytelling as drama. It's just more subtle. It's the shadow, the negative space we want to see filled in. When your friend introduces the Nicolas Cage story, there are pieces missing. You want to know how they got from their stale bagel to being in a fender bender with an internet meme. You want to know what happened afterwards. You want to know why Nick Cage is now standing outside your window. The whys and hows keep you invested in the premise, even if your friend's story is something as simple as, I'm mad at my dad, or I started an OnlyFans. That balance between premise, delay, and payoff can be shifted and played with as long as you're still creating an enjoyable experience for your audience, which as a reminder, is the goal. I don't know when artists started counting it as a win for large groups of people to not enjoy your art, probably sometime around Rick and Morty, but as an audience we are getting on a ride that should take us seamlessly throughout this emotional roller coaster, and we should never have to stop, get out, and push the ride forward ourselves to get it going again. Because you know what? We don't have to. There are so many other rides, and there are plenty of them that don't demand you bear with them until they're good, or hold the payoff hostage until you compliment the director on their literary brilliance. And if you can't even hold someone's attention long enough to show them the thing you made, then your art has failed. Neil. In the early 2000s, Hollywood was in an era of pretty straightforward storytelling. A big complaint I remember hearing at the time was that movies were way too predictable. Your dad could always see that ending coming, and boy did people hate it when the thing they thought was gonna happen, happened. But then we all rode the lost jet straight into the desert island of subverted expectations, which is where we've been for the past couple decades, although I think the pendulum is finally starting to swing back the other way again. Subverted expectations were all the rage. Back in my day, not a single villain ever made it through a monologue. Now I have a weapon that only I could defeat, and when I unleash it, I'll get- <laughs> You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I will not be bullied by that! Handle this like civilized man to move on- Anybody make so much- <laughs> That was a good one. And there was some great writing that came out of this. This was literally the golden age of television, and mystery was an important component to that. Without it, you get, I don't know, married with children? Superman comics? Propaganda, basically. But encouraging mystery too much gives you clickbait, how I met your mother, uh, and the opportunity for these dorks to abuse their power over women, just like the cool kids. There are two ways mystery can go wrong. One is making promises you can't keep selling us on the eventual whys and hows, and then failing to deliver on those in a satisfying way. I actually love Lost, it's on the list. The other way is to just not make any promises at all, and I think that one's a much easier trap to fall into. I happened to try out the Netflix psychological thriller You earlier this week, and full disclosure, I only watched three episodes, and then I stopped, because it didn't hold my attention. It's about a man with a never-ending inner monologue who's obsessed with this girl he saw once and becomes determined to make her date him, to the point where he stalks her, manipulates her life, and eventually kills people when they get in his way. It's really close to having multiple interesting reasons to keep watching, yet somehow I just don't quite care enough about any of them. This girl isn't likable enough, the guy somehow isn't creepy enough, the things he does aren't even new or unique, it's all just rehashed from better scenes out of Dexter and Breaking Bad. And at the end of the three episodes, I was left wondering what the show was even about. Like, am I waiting for them to fall in love? For him to kill her? For people to catch him? What am I signing up for? Not knowing the ending is fine, I just need something to root for now. It could be as simple as seeing this genius psycho having to find his way out of his next predicament, or the development of these two people's relationship through genuine interactions as they get to know each other and become more vulnerable. In those cases, the promise of the show would be that I get to see more of these fun characters. But I don't really want to. Celebrity authors. That fox was pretty obscure. She is Courtney Love's maternal grandmother. You're not expected to know that. Good. I didn't. Mr. Mooney wants anyone in here who's even tangentially famous. He thinks it sells more books. That's sad. People buying books because of what's popular, not because they want to be moved. Can you imagine walking past two people talking to each other like that? If you ever do, you were obligated to spill coffee on them. You is so focused on baiting you to keep watching that they forget to give a good reason to watch in the first place. It's like writing backwards. It's promising a promise. It's the watch till the end TikTok tag of filmmaking. Like, yeah, whoa, he kills a guy in his basement. But when Walter White did that, I knew his endgame. I knew how far this was taking him from his intended path. 
I knew his mistakes that led him into the situation and how he felt about being there and that his desperate need for money and validation that had caused this whole mess in the first place would ultimately keep him from changing his mind. And so when you watch him kill the guy, you're not thinking, whoa, what an unhinged enigma. You're thinking, I probably wouldn't do that, but I get it. I have now watched all eight episodes of Fallout, and I'm sorry to say that it absolutely has these same problems. I will admit, it does eventually do most of the things I complained about it missing in the first two episodes. When Lucy finds Maximus, it's like a whole new show. We finally have two characters experiencing this new world in their own ways and sharing their differing experiences. We get a clear idea of who they are relative to each other in the wasteland, even if those personalities didn't exist until right now. This guy was a shell of a man with school shooter eyes one episode ago, and now he's a charming goofball in power armor? I mean, I like him, but he's a different guy. This whole scene on the bridge is actually perfect. It's a tense situation with everyone involved having different perspectives and different methods of dealing with the same problem. It shows Lucy's desperate optimism, Max's uncertain suspicion, and the Wasteland's survival-first attitude all at once. It sets up stakes, it's funny, it establishes a clear tone. If this had been the end of the first episode, I would have been completely on board from the beginning. Unfortunately, this is episode five. It took nearly five hours to finally establish the main characters. Perfect. Honestly, if you're gonna watch any of it, it could probably just be this one episode. The ones after this mostly involve explaining to us via the main characters how the world ended, and episodes two through four don't need to exist. They're just a holding pattern for the characters to wander around in while we do enough world building to catch the new audience up to speed with the people who already played the games. It seems like Fallout tries to mimic the games a lot, but what works in video games doesn't necessarily work in a TV show, because in a game you're steering a single perspective, your perspective, while in a show you're watching other people omnisciently. There's actually a lot to be said about playing into the medium that you choose, especially with like adaptations. Hold on. Games aren't movies. So if Fallout is an example of dragging out character development and dangling mysteries at the finish line in order to keep our attention long enough to explain us the story, then how exactly are you supposed to do it? How do you keep your story focused on character drama while giving your audience important contextual information about the world? How do you keep it intriguing enough to dig further without making it seem like there's all these things we should know but don't? I'm tired of hearing myself complain, so let's look at stuff I like. A warning, I'm gonna be spoiling some very spoilable things. We're talking the avocados of TV and film here. We're leaving them out on the counter. They will be brown in 10 minutes, so I'm gonna put spoiler tags for each thing as they come up. I wasn't an anime person for a long time. There are common trends in the medium that I just personally don't like and find hard to ignore. Things like repetitive pacing, pathetic protagonists, and... But I've come to appreciate anime's strengths, and found several that I think are actually incredible, or at least really fun. If I had to recommend one to anybody, especially someone who hasn't watched much anime and doesn't intend to, it would be Attack on Titan. The pacing is incredible, better than a lot of American television. Its women are completely normal and portrayed as human beings, and it reveals the details of its deeply mysterious world so smoothly that you never have to stop to sort through it all. The way it does this is simple. You know what the characters know, including how much they don't know. Here come the spoilers. If you're gonna watch the show, I highly recommend and not learning about it first promise it's worth it. When Attack on Titan starts, you're introduced to the basic premise through the way these people are forced to live their lives. They're in a single city surrounded by walls to keep out giant, grotesque, human-shaped monsters that want to literally eat them and are incredibly difficult to kill. People seem to know that life wasn't always like this, but nobody was around to remember a time before or knows exactly what changed or where the walls even came from. So they do their best to live normal lives while a select few become soldiers to keep the Titans at bay and occasionally venture out into the world. We begin our story when this even bigger guy shows up, kicks in the wall, and Titans get in. From here, it all feels like what you probably thought it was going to be. People zipping around rooftops, slicing up big monsters with swords. You know, anime stuff. Until the main character dies. This still isn't revealing anything new, it's just driving home how bad things are. 
We've seen a lot of characters legitimately die up to this point, and this guy was no exception. It's a bleak world, and they have set up the boundaries very clearly by showing us the struggles all these people go through on a daily basis. We've spent several episodes by this point watching these kids go through tragedy, train to fight back, learn everything their military knows about what these monsters are and how to deal with them, and still wind up failing, just like everyone who came before them. We are told that this is life. This is the whole thing. Because to these people, it is. Sure, they may wonder about seeing the ocean. They may feel it's unjust that this is happening to them and want it to change. But they've lived this way their entire lives. It's tragic, but it's normal. And we sink right into that normalcy while we watch these people make decisions and feel things. And that all paves the way for something truly unexpected to happen. <laughs> That is the best punch ever, and I say that as someone who really likes punching. When this happens, you and the characters have the same reaction. Namely, what? A bunch of questions start going through your head, and the characters on screen echo those questions. Why did the Titan just attack the other Titans? Has that ever happened before? Is he on our side? Why does he look like Eren? And is he somehow hot? I didn't say he was, I was just wondering if you thought that. And when the Titan splits open and Eren is inside, his friends don't just go, oh cool, he's alive, let's keep fighting. They're freaked out, what is going on? These are emotions the characters are feeling, and you are along for the ride. The show continues to do this, with new information information being uncovered as characters dig into their own world at great personal sacrifice. There is never anything gained without loss, and no new information changes anything that has already happened. As a result, the world expands, but always from that same central point where we started, around these three main characters and their goals. If you skipped, welcome back! At no point during this do we switch perspectives to somebody who clearly knows what's going on and just isn't telling anybody. We never have Michael Emerson show up and cryptically talk about this huge important thing going on beyond our little main character's comprehension, and how they'll never truly understand the gravity of the blah 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 blah. Now we're gonna talk about Severance, because it does dangle secrets over our heads, but somehow doesn't feel the same. This show is the newest addition to my favorites list, it has only one season so far, and that season doesn't end with me knowing anything more about the larger machinations of the plot than when I started, but I don't care. And it is mostly because because I love these guys. I love watching these four little office workers run around and try to solve the mystery of what their employer wants while also trying to not bite the hand that feeds them. It actually does the same thing as Attack on Titan, which is that you know what they know. It's just that what they know is a little more complicated, because the premise is that all of their minds have been split in half, so they have a work self and a home self, and each one only remembers their own respective events. So a lot of the time, you have more information than any one character, but most of the characters don't have more information than you. And that is an important distinction. It's what creates something called dramatic irony. Someone walks into their dark apartment, you see a figure move behind them, and you realize the killer is in the house, but the character in the scene doesn't know yet. This is another form of telling you what's going to happen, or setting an expectation. You're glued to your screen, waiting for that person to notice the thing you already know, because you want to see how they react. In Severance, spoiler time, skip ahead if you don't want to know anything, you know what Mark is doing both in and out of work. You're introduced right away to the possibility that he could remember both, and you want to see it when it happens. You want any Mark to learn about his sister. You want Audi Mark to learn about his co-workers. You don't see the others outside the office, but neither do they. And when they finally do see their lives outside, they're learning about it with you, so it never feels like they're withholding information. There are characters who speak cryptically and imply greater knowledge, but the reason it works here is because that is who they are in the story. They are withholding that information from our protagonists too, and even when we see them alone, we're watching them struggle with their own emotions and personal problems, which we understand even if we don't have the full context behind them. Finally, and welcome back, The Sixth Sense. I will spoiler tag this one but I'm guessing you know it. In M. Night Shyamalan's one-way ticket to doing whatever he wanted for the rest of his life, Bruce Willis is a psychologist trying to help this kid who says he sees dead people. He's also struggling with a failing marriage, his own skepticism, and his inability to open this door, so he has problems too. We learn as an audience that the kid is telling the truth, which is fun, because then we want to see the adult finally believe it's real. What I think goes unnoticed is that this story is good enough on its own. There could be no twist ending, and it's still worth watching. But then we get the reveal that Bruce Willis is dead. 
It's kind of insane how hard this twist hits when we watch him die in the opening scene of the movie. And it works because of how intentionally we are grounded in this central conflict. We are so absorbed in his story that we ignore the irrelevant little hints all around us because when he assumes his wife isn't looking at him because she's angry, we believe that. When he shrugs off the door that won't open, we throw away that information too. We're using him as a point of reference, so it doesn't occur to us to wonder how Cole would react if one of his ghosts ever started trying to help him. We just assume this is how he talks to doctors. So when the truth is laid out in front of us, it doesn't feel like a cheap trick. We didn't even know to look for it, but now it makes more sense than it did without that information. The big word I'm deciding to use for all this is recontextualization. Instead of letting the audience know from the beginning that there's this big thing they don't get to know about yet, you make the world perfectly sensible and self-contained from the perspective you present. As your characters work toward their goals, inherently pushing against the walls they think they know, they and your audience start to learn that some of their assumptions were wrong. This broadens the borders of your world naturally, and maybe even changes the meaning of things that have already happened. Even in The Princess Bride, the most straightforward chronological story I can think of off the top of my head, we're introduced to the Dread Pirate Roberts, a new character with his own skills, humor, and personality, and then we learn that he's Wesley, the dead love interest from the beginning of the movie, and it recontextualizes the already great story we've been watching and deepens it. Even if you see it coming, because it's not hidden super well or anything, you get to watch him reveal his identity to other people, and that's enough. The clearest example of this I've ever seen is in a book series I just got around to reading. I'm not going to spoiler tag it, I'm just going to say it's A Court of Thorns and Roses. If you've read it, you know what I mean. If you haven't, and trust my writing opinions, I highly recommend the first two books. Recontextualization can go wrong if not used carefully. In Lost, they try to recontextualize things like every episode. Not for the characters, just for you. Everyone in the show knows more than you do all the time, and it does get exhausting. Thankfully, other parts of the show are incredible. It's a beautiful mess. If you're not careful, you can also fall into retconning, which is changing things that we already saw happen because the new context doesn't make sense otherwise. In the 2013 movie Now You See Me, which I will also not spoiler tag because no one should ever watch it, a group of magicians get contacted by a mysterious benefactor with a plan to rob a bank. The movie is mostly about a detective trying to catch them after the heist, which is already a weird idea. Like, if your pitch is magicians rob a bank, I want to see them do that. But you see, the heist is a magic trick, and I'm the audience, so obviously they pulled one over on me, and who cares how they did it? The real mystery is who contacted them in the first place. I bet it's gonna be a crazy reveal. Oh my god. <laughs> I did not see that coming. It's impossible! <laughs> that was actually, uh, pretty good. Thank you. It was the detective? But I've been watching that guy. Like, I've been staring at him for two hours, even when he was alone and struggling. It seems like he would have broken character at some point. Or is it like The Sixth Sense, where I was misdirected away from all these obvious little clues, like a... What would that be? Oh, like a magic trick. Turns out, the trick was lying. As long as you don't take back things you already did, recontextualizing doesn't even require that much planning, you could do it by accident and still have it work. You could look at what you made, see a pattern forming that you didn't originally intend, and then come up with a new explanation that takes the story in a whole different direction. Fallout doesn't recontextualize. It can't, because it doesn't give us a sense of normalcy for the characters who live in this world, so there's nothing to reframe. We're just told from the beginning that we don't have the full story, and so we have to watch these characters go from place to place and have the story explained to them for us right up until the end, where that happens some more. America outsourced the survival of this country to the private sector. We kept Vault Tech alive instead. Isn't that why you came to the surface, really? To know why I took him? What if I tell you how I know your father? You want to know how I know your daddy, don't you? I had to make a choice. By the time the show ends, we should know everything and just be watching the consequences of all these decisions unfold. Instead, we listen to multiple competing villains explain what actually happened, more soldiers get slaughtered to mid-century jazz music, all the main characters shoot each other, and a few people say war Boy, never changes. changes, which Lucy proves by shooting her zombie mom and then watching her dad fly over the ruins of Los Angeles in a mech suit. And then she does the only thing she can do, which is follow the next guy, until presumably more stuff gets explained to her. Norm never actually becomes a main character either. He just realizes that he has a camera following him around, and so he goes places where the writers want us to see things. I still think the rest of the Vault Dwellers could have just died, and all that exposition could come from somewhere else. Like, Lucy finds other vaults. She knows a guy 
guy who was alive before the fall of civilization, and we already see his whole story in flashbacks that are incredibly interesting. Her brother could even have survived alone and been trapped in the other two empty vaults or wandered the wasteland for a bit himself and uncovered information that way, maybe while looking for his sister. In the end, my favorite character actually became the only one I've somehow barely talked about. I'm super interested in watching Maximus get all of this power he never asked for and barely earned. It's exactly the kind of pickle I love watching underdogs punch their way out of. So good job, Fallout. You caught my attention. And it only took the entire show. But I'm guessing the next season isn't just gonna suddenly handle itself better because they have a good starting concept now. Maybe it will, though. I'm genuinely curious because there was enough good here that I could see it being one of those shows where the first season is kinda weak, but then the rest gets awesome. Anyway, guess I'll be back. Ta -da. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I'm gonna go edit this right now. Red Bull. We got like 150 new people on Patreon after the last video went up, so uh, thank you so much. Still working our way up to the 4,000, so uh, if you like these videos and want to support more and are also interested in getting bonus podcasts every week or getting access to special merch or downloads of all the videos or a few other things that I'm forgetting, uh, head on over to patreon.com slash doormonster and consider supporting the show. You can also get t-shirts and other merchandise from our T Public store. Get them while they're available. Or I'm gonna be moving it to a different storefront sometime soon as well. And I don't know exactly what we'll be migrating, but currently we have a bunch of our old popular ones available. I'm gonna keep making more of these. I, I probably like a lot of them. I'm really enjoying it. Also, Matt's coming uh, to visit soon and we're gonna film some more sophisticated gamers videos. So that'll be fun. Oh, also we have a TikTok. If you're on TikTok, go, uh, I'll put a link. And you should go follow us on TikTok, another platform. You know how the, you know how the internet works. What else? Um, Allison and I stream once a week over on a, a different channel that's also in the description. We just do live hangouts and chat about stuff. Yeah, uh, thanks for watching. I'm gonna go, I gotta pee real bad.